Thank you, Jeanette. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Daniel Cruz, who did his medical school residency and fellowship here at UCLA. And he has taken a special interest in our congenital patients ever since I've been a trainee here and um, is active in our transition program, taking the pediatric transplant patients to the adult side and really helping bridge that gap. And so really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Uh, so I'll be speaking uh, about the management and optimization of the Fontan patient who's awaiting transplant. So I want to begin with, with this slide, which has been around for a little while, but I want you to focus on those two curves for just a moment uh, and just kind of accept that this is a really tough problem that we have in front of us. That's why we have this symposium. And though uh, this is from 1990 to 2008, it's kind of unbiased data. These are not single center studies. This is all the UNOS data from this period. And it's easy to see the slope that the congenital heart disease patients uh, embark on when they undergo transplant. And so for the referring doctors, I, it's a tough place to be because in your mind, this is the slope you're thinking about. And as a transplant cardiologist, this is the slope I'm thinking about. These patients end up dying from primary graft failure, multi-organ failure, hemorrhage, rejection, infection, and stroke. And we know that the Fontan is the toughest of the tough. So this slope is even worse for the Fontans. So this is what I think of uh, when I see a Fontan patient in consultation. I think we are not on the bunny slopes anymore. Um, this is a double black diamond, and we better think long and hard before jumping off this cliff, uh, both for the patient and for the program. And is this the right time, and can we do it? And so we talked about selection of patients. Uh, the focus of this talk is really this. Once we decide we're gonna list the patient, what can we do, and how can we create a framework to get it right? Uh, the one reference that I strongly recommend for anybody who's interested in really trying to see what's gonna happen in the future is this. It's from Philip Tetlock, it's called Super Forecasting, came out a couple years ago. But uh, he actually became quite well known about 30 years ago when he published a paper a uh, very high impact paper that political, political experts were terrible at predicting what was gonna happen. But there was a small subset that were just a little bit less terrible, okay? So based on that, the CIA gave him a lot of money to run something, a forecasting tournament. And the forecasting tournament was, was awesome. It was like elite institutions. The CIA had a team and he had a team of like lay people like just people like us who just were interested in thinking about problems. And for four years in a row, the lay people crushed everybody. And it's a great story, but what comes from it is that, that these super forecasters, these people who could see forward just a little bit further, had some qualities that set them apart. They were very open-minded. They were very, very willing to change their mind when data changed. They were not necessarily brilliant, but they were pretty smart. They could analyze problems from the outside view first and then focus on the internal views. And they had a growth mindset. They actually thought they could get better at forecasting. And they knew the difference from the luck and skill. They knew when they got lucky. We got this question right, but we really got lucky. They knew that. And they also learned that they worked better when they worked together. So I bring all this up because I think this is the key to how we change the slope in this patient population. So how are we doing in heart transplant? Well, it turns out, unlike political experts, we obsess with measurements. Like we know our death on the waiting list for every patient, for every program in the United States. And we know the outcomes for every patient post-transplant, how long they live, when they die, and what they die from. And I won't talk about it here, I'll talk about it at American Heart, but about a third have a real strength, about a third are average, and about a third have a real weakness. And so we are not across the board as expected, which is what we're led to believe. So let me put forth an idea. How can you do this better? Well, first of all, forecasting is important, okay? Uh, and that, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in just a little bit more, but there's also backcasting. And this comes from this, uh, this book by Annie Duke, who's a poker player, poker pro, she's amazing. Um, but backcasting is actually putting yourself, putting yourself here, 
The patient has the offer. And actually working backwards and saying, what did we do right all along to actually get us here? This is the cheerleader. This is us. This is Jeanette Lynn saying, we can do this, right? And, uh, and, then, and then there's also the pre-mortem, which is basically putting yourself here and saying, why did we fail? Where did we get it wrong? It's the heckler. It's the person saying, I don't think we should do this. But the two together really create the whole picture. So you forecast, you backcast, and you think about all the things that can go wrong. And that's why all these meetings actually make a difference. And so I would argue that though that slope happens in the OR, and we can't do this with Dr. Lax and all the other surgeons, there's a lot that happens before then that actually sets up those slopes. So this is a slide. I will not give you the references. If you're interested in them, please email me. There's too many. But I think we can accept that these are important variables in the Fontan patients that either favor success or favors failure. So you got to start by saying, what is the outside view? The outside view is terrible. This is an 80% survival rate at best if you take all comers, probably a little lower. And you can argue we're a little better lately. But at the end of the day, it's a very high, high mortality that goes on with the Fontan patient going in trans transplant. So how can you adjust that 80% upwards? And what's going to bring it downwards? When does it become 70% and when does it become 85%? How do you think about that? Well, you look at the inside view. What is this patient presenting with? Okay, so I'm gonna go through each of these with two cases. This is the first. This is a, a patient who's sensitized and waiting at home. She's 34. She has tricuspid atresia and hypoplastic pulmonary arteries and the BT shunt. She had a modified RA to PA Fontan and the mitral valve repair. Her revision was at the age of 20, and she starts having arrhythmias and failing Fontan physiology, and this is back when Dr. Child was with, uh, with the program, and he sent her to us because uh, her EF was 35%. She was increasing doses of Lasix, starting to get a little bit of ascites. Her liver started showing signs of some cirrhosis, so she did not have a biopsy because her synthetic function was intact. She's just, she's at home, but not well enough to go to work or school, and she's 100% sensitized. So for those of you who are wondering what is this whole sensitization business, it basically means if you're 100% sensitized, there's 0% donors that are gonna match you, okay? And so in taking us through this patient, what, fa what favors success in her? Well, she's not frail, she doesn't have PLE, her nutrition is intact, her MELD score and VAS score are pretty good. She might have a little bit of something going on with her liver, but I still think it's not necessarily favoring favor. Her creatinine is perfect, she's sensitized, but she has her spleen, so we, we can work with that. And you know, her volume status is not that bad. So she also has a low EF, which in terms of is favorable. Preserved EF is a tougher fontan. Um, and she doesn't have heterotaxy, but she's had a few sternotomies, so we gotta at least accept that it's a higher risk. And uh, her bleeding risk, I would say, is high because she's a fontan, but we don't know about her collaterals at this point. Her lungs are pretty intact. Her FEV1 is 49%. Um, so here we go. Uh, these are her antibodies. So we've all seen this. If you work with Fontan patients, you look at that and you're like, great. Uh, thankfully, she came to us early, so we have some time to work on this. So I see this patient, I'm like, well, I'm going to try something gentle like IVIG and rituximab and kind of hope it works. And so that's really how we start. We, we see the patient. I don't list this patient because I have zero chance of transplanting you, and I don't want you to die on my waiting list. I will not list you. We will not list you unless we really think we can do it. So we embark on this Rituxab IVIG protocol. She gets admitted with syncope and dehydration. While she's there, we check her antibodies, and look at that. She's down to 36%. We're pretty excited about this because this gives us an avenue. And actually, based on this, we do list her. She goes back to waiting at home. She waits another, I think, six months. A heart becomes available, and this is the op note, just literally lifted. Severe adhesions throughout the entire metastinum. The conduit was essentially stuck to the back of the sternum and was entered on sternotomy. However, we were already bypassed via the groin. We took down the retrosternal adhesions, again, that were amazingly severe. The entire metastinum was almost frozen. We did have some problems with pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure, which required us to return the bypass two separate times. The patient left the operating room on very high doses of inotropic support and nitric oxide with improving right heart function and pulmonary artery pressures. Her chest was closed a few days later. She's nine years post-op. She has no antibodies. She's doing well. But even the easy Fontan patient exceeds the risk of a standard heart transplant recipient. 
you got to start with your base rate. These are tough patients even when they look easy. The second one is waiting in the hospital. She is um, 39. Uh, actually, this is the patient that uh, Jeanette showed her collateral being coiled, so it's perfect uh, continuity here. Uh, she has a classic BT shunt at one year of age, uh, RAPA Fontan, Fontan revision, complicated, complicated by TIA and stroke, preserved ejection fraction, no PLE. Hypoxic to 81, 82%, has a bunch of collaterals. She has pulmonary hypertension on an endothelial antagonist and phosphodesterase inhibitor. She has cirrhosis clinically or cl uh, on, on, on imaging, but the biopsy was not really of good quality. Um, her albumin is preserved, platelets are good, she's had paracentesis, and again, extensive uh, varices on CT scan. Possible SVP in the past as well. She's referred to us from, uh, from an outside institution. All this is outside. She's 100% sensitized, has one kidney. Her crayon is 1.4 to 1.6, but she's on very high dose diuretics. And she has small femoral arteries and an occluded popliteal artery in chronic leg pain. And so when she walks, she has leg pain. And she looks kind of a little bit, kind of, Cachectic-ish, right? She's really very on stage, and Jeanette's thinking, we can do this, and I'm like, I don't know, Jeanette. Uh, but this is what she looks like, uh, in my mind anyway. This is a tough on tan, base rate 80%, and you can see that she's not necessarily frail, or her nutrition is okay, but she has a lot of things going against her. You know, she has a high VAS score, has, you know, markers of cirrhosis with these massive varices around her esophagus. Her, she only has one kidney, it works, but she's on high doses of diuretics. And we know that this is a risk factor for Fontan's going in. She's heavily sensitized, and we know that this is somebody that's gonna need higher and stronger desensitization approach, like Velcade, which is basically chemotherapy to knock out your B cells, okay? So her volume status is not good. Her PVR is high. She has preserved EF, which is a bad marker. She has multiple schnotomies, she has a bunch of collaterals, and her lungs are very marginal. So this is about as tough as you can possibly get, okay, for a Fontan. The question is, do you do heart only? Do you do a heart liver? How do you decide? So this is a case where we did not even bother rebiopsying her liver because we know that the biopsy can lead us astray, and she's already very high risk, vascular is high, and we think that this is a patient who should have dual organ, with the extensive varices she has, so we committed to do an organ without another biopsy. These are her antibodies, and um, you can see, for those who are immunologists, her C1Q antibodies are 91, everything's 100% and super high, and we told her, we will bring you into the hospital and give you one round of desensitization with Velcade and plasmapheresis. If you respond, we will move forward. If you do not respond, we will not move forward and we will call it a day. We know we have to draw lines in the sand somewhere, right? Otherwise, you are leading someone astray and actually incurring more risk than you can handle. So she, uh, again, uh, we did not list her with those antibodies. We did a trial of Velcade and plasmapheresis. Uh, she actually had a nice response in that her C1Q antibodies went down to 4%, though she remained 100% sensitized. We will list you if you're sensitized if you give us a clue that we can actually work with your antibodies. Uh, right afterwards, uh, number three, uh, Jamil coiled her uh, early on. But then right after that, she had like four infections after the Velcade and plasma freeze. It took us two months to fix her infections, and some of them I hadn't even heard of before. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, she recovered we listed her, but we had lines in the sand. We said, we will not keep you on the list if we lose your kidneys. We gotta keep the kidneys going. So she went on CVVH early on after listing, and we took her off the list. We're not going to do something stupid. So she recovered from that, and then she got a Klebsiella pneumonia, and her PCO2 went to 75, and she was on BiPAP. We delisted her. We said, we're not gonna do something stupid. We know a ventilated patient is a very high-risk patient. Uh, we got her through that. And then she's really getting very frail. And after six months and two daughters that almost hit, I think this is my favorite slide, because it was an email exchange from the transplant coordinator. And she emailed me and a few other people, and she said, hey guys, her parameters are set at five foot six. That's her max, and her weight's 180. She was screened off, it means she missed a donor that was five foot eight last night. This offer was from Northern California, and I don't believe it would have come in her anyway. However, wondering if we would be able to open up her parameters a bit that could potentially capture more offers. And the liver surgeon, who's in the audience, 
replied, ah, I think if it's a local donor, we can be a little more flexible. Go to five foot eight, right? So the coordinator pushes the envelope, the liver surgeon bends a little bit, and three days later, a five foot seven donor became available, okay? No joke, this is three days later, a five foot seven donor. So the coordinator saved this lady's life just by pushing the envelope a little bit. So had three antibodies. It turns out the liver protects you from rejection. We took the chance. They were high titers, but we did it anyway. Um, she did not have femoral arteries that could be bypassed, that, that, to put her on a femoral bypass. So we actually had hard backup offers. We had a, a patient at Cedars who was ready to take the heart, another patient who was ready to take the liver, should there have been a catastrophe on entering her chest. All that was lined up in advance because we owe it to the donors to get it right. And she did well after two months in the hospital, tracheostomies and everything else. But in summary, think very hard, never forget the true base rate, back casting and premortems, optimize the frailty, draw some lines in the sand, focus on end organ perfusion. If you can't fix it, then restore it or replace it, including the kidney. Sensitize patients, you gotta pick the right battles, you can't give everybody Velcade. Uh, if you have ascites, it's not cosmetic. This is gonna bite you with RV failure afterwards, so get rid of it. Fix the PVR, minimize bleeding through what we've talked about, and then broaden the donor pool. This sets programs aside who have good wait list survival. They broaden the donor pool, just like that coordinator did with that email. So that's all I have for you.